Okay, ready to start. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's OBSSR Director's Webinar entitled Conversational Agents to Improve Quality of Life and Palliative Care. I'm Bill Riley, Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research here at the NIH. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few housekeeping items to mention. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available in about a month on the OBSSR website. Um, today's presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. Um, all the phone lines will be muted during the webinar itself. Questions and comments will not be taken via phone, but will be taken via the WebEx Q&A feature, which you usually can find on the right side of your screen. Uh, to ask a question or send a comment, you can click on Q&A, select all panelists, type in your question, and send. And you can send a question anytime during the webinar, uh, but we'll um, tally them up and ask them at the end. And following the presentation, Bill Elwood coordinates our webinar series, will facilitate the question and answer sessions, and ask your questions to the presenter. All right, so without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Uh, Pasha Orlo. Dr. Pasha Orlo is professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. He's associate program director for a general internal medicine postdoctoral fellowship program there, and associate section chief for research for the section of general internal medicine at Boston University. He's a nationally recognized expert in the field of health literacy and is currently an investigator on five grants examining health literacy, including two intervention studies evaluating simplified information technologies for behavior change among minority patients. His work has brought attention to the role that health literacy plays in racial and ethnic disparities, self-care for patients with chronic diseases, end-of-life decision-making, and the ethics of research with human subjects. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Pasha Orlo to the OBSSR Director's Webinar for his presentation on Conversational Agents to Improve Quality of Life and Palliative Care. Michael, I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I think a more simple way to say all of that is I get attracted to things that are complicated for patients and for families to do, and in particular, complicated from the lens of, you know, people who have limited education. But, but really, there are lots and lots of people who have a rough go at the experience of being a patient in the United States, and so there's a lot of work to be done, and this is a field that some people come to call uh, health literacy, things that are complicated for patients and their families. And then the question is, you know, what's to be done and, and how to find uh, opportunities uh, to improve matters. So uh, today I'm going to describe um, a system that we've been working with that we have in the field um, uh, using conversational agents. Uh, so let me just start off by talking a little bit about what I mean, what is a conversational agent. So, in body conversational agents, uh, the way we use this uh, terminology and the systems that we're creating in, in this line of my work um, are computer characters that talk to uh, a patient, to a participant, to a user, um, and that the user uh, responds back with a touch screen, uh, thereby emulating, but not really, but emulating a face-to-face -face communication through the means of a touch screen. The goal is to develop a therapeutic alliance using empathy, gaze, posture, gesture, um, behavioral techniques, and interactions that are highly tailored to the person's response, the user's responses, in conversations over time. Um, and we've, we've developed a series of these uh, systems. Um, my main collaborator in this work is uh, Tim Bickmore and his group um, out of uh, Northeastern University, just a couple miles away here. And really, our teams together, my team and Tim's team, have developed a series of these agents for different types of uh, 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 interventions and with different types of goals. For example, we developed uh, an embodied conversational agent system, which was uh, took the role of an educator at the time of discharge from the hospital, um, and uh, did a study. That character was uh, the Louise system, and um, you know, Louise was brought to the bedside for patients you know, being discharged from the hospital. And as you can imagine, um, you know, interacting with the, with the computer is, is not the same as interacting with the human, but 
you know, for better and for worse. Um, humans tend to be rushed and pressed for time, and, and the patients feel that. Um, and so um, you end up uh, seeing that some people even would prefer to interact with the computer system. Uh, I prefer Louise. She's better than the doctor. She explains more, and the doctors are always in a hurry, for example. Um, and um, uh, it was just like a nurse actually better because sometimes the nurse just gives you the paper and says, here you go, and Louise explains everything. Well, we also developed an, a system uh, to promote walking uh, with older adults. This is the Tanya system. Um, and in, uh, in this system, uh, um, older adults were asked to interact with the character daily over the course of several months and um, interacted by, you know, touching the screen and, and uh, with these kinds of face-to-face uh, -face interaction. And we were able to uh, improve walking for older adults in Boston uh, in an intervention study using this system. So um, the current project that I'm going to talk about, oh, uh, this is just to show that, um, you know, in these, in these projects we, we tend to look at a lot of um, elements of uh, who uh, interacted more with the system or less and who was more satisfied in different dimensions. Um, and some of the consistent messages have been that people with low health literacy, people with more depressive symptoms, um, uh, people with lower education uh, tend to be more satisfied uh, and, uh, and uh, trust the system more and attribute human characteristics. For example, here we, they ask, you know, do you like Tanya? Uh, you know, very strong responses. Uh, do you feel she cares about you? Um, you know, on a Likert scale, you know, uh, pretty much if if you're if you're like you know, it's a computer. What do you mean she does she like me? It's a computer. The answer is four. You know, in the middle on a Likert scale. But consistently, um, lots of people rate these systems, you know, in the positive range for all these kinds of dimensions. Um, so in the current program, in the current project, um, we were uh, aiming to apply this kind of a uh, interface, this kind of a, a system to some, some of the challenges in, in palliative care. So um, the first thing I just want to say off the bat is this, this talk is really not a talk about palliative care. Um, this is uh, very much kind of aiming to go upstream from uh, from that scene um, right now. My, most pe you know most people um, currently see palliative care quite late in the disease process, um, and uh, the the agenda is explicitly trying to go upstream of that um, in this program. So part of the issue is how do you identify patients earlier in their disease process? Um, how to understand patients' experiences with severe illness, um, how to have a system that could be responsive to identified needs and to support patients. And this is the kind of stuff that we were thinking about in the design of this, of this system. I should also mention this, uh, this is uh, supported by an R01 through NINR with additional support as well from OBSSR, and we're quite grateful for that. Um, this is a multiple PI uh, mechanism with, uh, with me and Tim Vickmore uh, as we've been developing these systems together over, over this past decade. Um, in this project, we really um, expanded the agenda of our work quite a, quite a bit, um, and we were aiming to uh, focus on people with severe severe illness, uh, incurable disease, and uh, to to uh, to support in various ways um, about symptoms, um, social isolation, depression, spiritual needs, advanced care planning, and I'll, I'll explain more what I'm talking about for each of these dimensions. Um, kind of. To locate all of this, um, the current project really is only in English, unfortunately. Um, that'd be great to move into other languages down the road. We have systems in Spanish, but this one is not yet in other languages. Um, and we're, we're aiming to in, uh, engage with people who have serious and in, incurable medical conditions with an estimated prognosis of less than 12 months. Um, at the same time, they would have to be able to independently consent and to interact with the system. Uh, people would not be eligible if they're already engaged in hospice. So you can see we were really trying to move the whole, um, the whole activity uh, farther upstream. That's an explicit goal of the program. Um, 
our, our aims ultimately, we're in the field, we're in the middle of this trial, um, but ultimately our aims are to see if at six months um, uh, participation, usual care, plus the use of our body conversational agent system uh, would improve um, uh, quality of life. And we have a whole bunch of other um, outcomes of interest. But uh, really, I want to talk to you now for some time about Marie. This is the current system. Uh, Marie is uh, our current in body conversational agent system for this population with the following uh, modules, the following activities that, that the system can, can do. Um, and I'm going to go into some more detail um, along uh, as we go. Um, the first module uh, is about symptom monitoring and medication counseling. Uh, the second module is about physical activity promotion. Uh, the third one is stress reduction. The fourth one is spiritual needs assessment and support. The uh, fifth one is advanced care planning. And then six is just storytelling um, by the agent. Um, so uh, it, I think it also will help, help people think about this system to have a sense of how data can flow in the system and in our systems generally. Um, so we're, we're trying to make an appealing experience for a participant to interact with the embodied conversational agent. Um, data from those interactions um, can come out to a study nurse and to the, the research team. That is, we have a web interface um, uh, that uh, the, the study nurse and the research team can can see that data comes out, and the data comes out and is tagged in uh, accordance to different types of uh, alerts and are rated at different levels and types of alerts um, for for action. So um, the study nurse then can use this information and reach out to the treating team, for example, to send a message to the primary care provider, and there's uh, uh, guidance uh, for, you know, what, what to do, different alerts to, to act in different ways. Um, we're, uh, th this, our web interface is currently an independent standalone um, activity for the research nurse. So the research nurse then would uh, message in through EPIC, which is our EMR, to, uh, for example, the primary care provider, if that's what, uh, what's relevant. Um, the study nurse or the team uh, could reach out back to the participant. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, the, there, if there's a technical alert or something seems to be not working or the, the participant needs support in some technical way that maybe the team would just call the participant. And um, then there's also an opportunity for the participant to directly message the team in the system. So uh, information can, can flow in uh, various ways, but the, the main the main agenda, if you will, is that the participant in the ECA would be interacting and data could come out to, uh, to be used by us to activate the care team uh, to pay attention to uh, issues that we're identifying for the participants. So this is Marie, and um, uh, this is a kind of one of the ways that people can start into the system. Um, uh, you know, we develop these characters uh, with members of the target population and uh, um, with uh, some qualitative methods. We interact with people, patients, and um, to other members of the, of the target population to try to get a sense of, you know, who the character should be, what the character should look like, uh, age and gender and, and other types of characteristics, what's this person's backstory, and, and stuff like that. So um, Marie was named by patients, and, you know, uh, she is older than uh, in a certain sense. Uh, you know, at least gray hair, if, if you will, um, than many of our prior, than our prior um, uh, conversational agents. Um, and there are other characteristics about her that if people want to know more, I'm happy to describe. Um, and this is how a patient would, uh, a participant would, would use the system. Um, in this um, project, uh, the characters, uh, the system is rendered onto a Surface Pro tablet. Um, that we give to intervention subjects to take home. Um, it's got a uh, common ar armored case to it. But the, the, uh, the tablets are set up in a, in a way that's really um, um, arranged for ease of use. Um, we have um, 
um, configured a, a kiosk software that basically uh, allows us to control um, what's seen, you know, so the, the participant doesn't have to interact with icons to load up the system or to fire it up or find it somewhere. Uh, the character comes on uh, right away and, and can start interactions. So we've kind of um, designed the uh, very, you know, each of the aspects of the use, of the use experience for, for uh, ease of usability. Um, and that's just, needs, you just need to do those kinds of things uh, to make sure that you create a, a, a user interface that actually is, uh, is going to be easy to use for people who aren't familiar with computers. Um, uh, this is also a 4G system, so uh, data actually does come to our web interface uh, remotely um, and within seconds. Um, so it's a 4G Surface Pro tablet. So uh, one of our modules is uh, physical activity. Um, we promote, um, it, it, people please ask questions in the chat box if you have any questions along the way. I'm happy to um, answer any questions if, or go into more detail if people would like. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the um, uh, modules is about physical activity. The main, um, the, the, the physical activity um, uh, system is, uh, has kind of two paths to it. One is for people who uh, are able to walk, and then there's a whole different path if, uh, if people are not able to walk uh, that goes through and promotes and describes even with, with, uh, with uh, short video clips um, exercise that can be done in a chair um, if, someone, if someone's unable to walk. Um, the main approach, the main concept of the physical activity module is to uh, try to engage with people to set a goal and then uh, over time to check in about um, uh, if goals are being met and we have a fair amount of experience in the, in the space of, of how to do that and our prior systems um, since that, you know, it, uh, around physical activity, we also had pedometers and uh, of different kinds, and and that's that's not the main focus of this project. So this is really physical activity, but it's it's by self-report, um, not with uh, pedometers. So this is, um, uh, for example, uh, one of the, you know, if a person is is having trouble uh, in not doing, not fulfilling their goals with respect to um, their exercises in a chair, for example. Um, this is one of the, the screenshots for that. Advanced care planning, this module, um, the, the first agenda, the first main um, uh, work to be done in this uh, module is really all about having a healthcare proxy and talking with your healthcare proxy. Um, that's like the, the prime agenda of this module. After, after getting through that, it, um, we do try to engage with people about, you know, what is CPR and what is uh, uh, a respirator, what is intubation, and um, we uh, were effectively asking, you know, showing them images and asking, interacting with them, trying to uh, engage with them to make to see if they would, uh, if they have clear. Uh, views about their wishes, and if they would if they would talk with their proxy and with their um, um, physicians about these things. So we ask, you know, have you talked with your doctors about this and and stuff like that. So this is just uh, one of the images she can raise up when when talking about what is CPR and um, you know it's, that's the, that's the goal of that module. Another module is about stress reduction. Um, stress reduction uh, has a, a fair, a, a following different approaches within the module. Um, there's a breathing exercise, and then there's three different types of meditations that people can choose. Um, and in this part of the system, uh, people, participants, users can choose to have their own, you know, music. Um, they can. Um, they can play different types of music. They can choose which music they would like during um, the meditation um, activity if they would like. And there's opportunity, you know, we, we set these up for to start off as relatively short um, trained 
uh, meditations and uh, guided meditation, and then uh, over time they can choose to make them longer and to extend them or change the music or whatever they want. Uh, we have uh, th these three other modules, just to mention a few things about them. I don't think I grabbed screenshots on them just now, but um, symptom monitoring um, and medication counseling. This is about, um, you know, asking people about uh, their symptoms and then uh, the primarily it's a check-in, uh, you know, have, have you been taking your medicine for this? Uh, symptom, or and then to f try to find out what the what the problem is. You know, the the barrier, of course, is quite different if the person says, "I'm afraid to take this medicine," or or if they say, "I've run out of it." You know, so the messaging back to the providers is going to be uh, can be varied by the data that we collect. Um, and there's a uh, you know it's it's tracking over time. So uh, whatever symptoms uh, they've reported, we can check in on that again. You know, for example, you told me last time that you were having trouble with uh, shortness of breath. Can we talk about that again? Or, um, you know, uh, at one point you told me that you were having trouble with itching. Is that still a problem for you? You know, or if the person says, um, you know, that their pain is a five, you can say, oh, last time you told me it was four. Has it gotten worse? You know, so you can design these interactions um, uh, kind of in a fashion to the way a human would would interact with someone about it. In fact, um, we have to, you know, because it's software, it, you know, it knows exactly the data that it has, and so you actually have to soften it up a bit. If you if you were as exacting as the information was, people would be weirded out by it, right? I mean, if you said, for example, oh, on on July 2nd at 2 p.m., uh, you told me it was a four. Um, you know, so humans don't have memory like that, um, and so you, you have to um, kind of soften up on uh, what you, what you, what you, what the information that you have, um, so that it's not freaky. Um, so it can be more human-like, if you will. Uh, the spiritual needs assessment um, it uh, has kind of two whole. Um, uh, dimensions. Uh, one is kind of a, about a, about spiritual and religious background, um, and a whole other dimension is about um, needs and um, aspirations. Um, and there's uh, some activities in there also with respect to um, if the person says, for example, that they um, want to practice gratitude. Um, or um, if they if they uh, want to think about forgiveness, or you know different types of things that, um, um, that you know are, are in there, and it's it's uh, ultimately there are different pathways. There's a, in, in this but, um, one of the pathways would lead to um, uh, encouraging people to seek it, to, to interact with a chaplain or a clergy member if they have a relationship or if they uh, if, if they would like us to have a chaplain or, or clergy call them um, to uh, pursue you know one topic or another that, that they've identified through the conversation um, this was a fantastically fun uh, module to design we had a fantastic team and did a really very successful um, lab study um, as a as a developmental effort because this is the first type first time we've done this type of a topic. Um, we had a great team, uh, people, a very multicultural group of um, of folks, um, including ten different uh, religions and cultures, and um, and secular humanists and everybody. It was uh, it was really fun to create and uh, um, you know I hope that people really find a lot of benefit out of it. And storytelling, storytelling is um, uh, is really um, the character telling stories. And what we did here was we um, we uh, adapted um, effectively an online um, uh, soap opera. Uh, we had to take out some of the some of the mm, uh, scarier sub themes or subplots, but it does still have some intrigue like a soap opera and over time um, feels like a soap opera um, in in the voice of the of the character. 
So, um, uh, yeah, here's a screenshot for uh, symptom assessment. Oh, there's another component in the symptoms. If, if the person goes there, it also has like, like a quality of life kind of assessment component to it. And this part of the symptom assessment is kind of looking to see if they have symptoms and, and what they might be um, following the, um, um, the uh, Hamilton symptom uh, scale. Uh, so uh, eventually, if we haven't found uh, your symptom, if it's not on the Hamilton, then um, then there's a place where they can uh, type in a symptom that they want to focus on. Uh, here's a few slides about our consort diagram to date. We're in the field, so I hope people are not looking for outcome study, you know, an outcome study report today, but uh, we've been um, in the field and, and uh, enrolling people. We have uh, 63 people enrolled to date. Um, of the 63 people, uh, half are male and half are female, an average age of 58.8. Um, you know, uh, at Boston Medical Center, we have a relatively young population of sick patients. So um, it's kind of shocking to me to look and see a number like 58.8 for this sick population, but that's actually what we have. You know, because we, are, we need people to be uh, able to independently consent and to interact with the agent, we, uh, there's a group of people who are too sick uh, for, for this kind of a thing. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know, this is the, the younger side. But uh, I think it's actually quite typical for public hospitals around the country to have relatively young, sick patients. Two-thirds of the participants are African American. Almost half um, have a high school diploma, GED, or less education. And, uh, you know, 24 out of the group uh, are really not financially stable. Um, I feel that this means that we actually are uh, getting participants from our target population here at Boston Medical Center. This is, you know, pretty pretty good in terms of the diversity we're hoping for. Nineteen of the participants that have been enrolled are now done in the study. Uh, one because uh, that participant died. Um, of the uh, 19 that started, we were able to uh, have some form of, of, uh, outcome, of completed data with 17. Um, one of those not completed was because of death, and one was uh, had to be terminated early, and I can explain that. Um, and then there were uh, two other people who, uh, even though we were able to get some form of uh, final data, really couldn't participate because one had an incapacitating uh, uh, stroke uh, very soon after, uh, after enrolling, and one uh, because uh, uh, that participant um, had advanced metastatic disease and ended up uh, having a prolonged hospitalization and being um, uh, moved to hospice and uh, was, you know, is alive, but uh, is really quite incapacitated and is not interactive uh, at this point. So um, uh, the, the one participant that was terminated uh, was terminated because he uh, managed to break two tablets. Um, one tablet, um, uh, this is a, a bent tablet you can see, and he bent it even though it had a pretty good armored casing on it. He did this by managing to drop it in the street and then to roll his large motorized chair over it. Um, a few times, I don't know. Um, but this one is beyond repair. Um, there are two other devices, uh, one by this gentleman and one by another uh, participant that ended up with broken screens that, that the screens could be replaced. So basically we've had um, one device that was uh, ruined by the motorized chair and um, we have a termination rule that if you bust two devices that, uh, that you're out. So. Um, uh, but, you know, it's interesting to us uh, in, in comparison, in the walking study, we didn't have a single device that was lost, stolen, or broken. And in this study so far already, we have had uh, this one device completely uh, smashed and then uh, two others that had uh, broken screens, but they could be fixed. So I'm going to give uh, some information about the intervention experience to this point. Um, 
and um, and then make sure we leave time for any questions or discussions or, or, or worries or concerns. So um, there's been 30, we have 32 intervention participants. And amongst those 32, which, you know, some are done and some are early in the field and it's all, you know, all over the place, but they've had um, about, you know, on average 35 uh, conversations um, with the system, uh, with the agent, ranging from two to 107 conversations over the course of their participation to this point. Um, and in a given conversation, uh, you could interact with a bunch of different modules, as you could imagine. Um, so uh, the, I'm going to now uh, talk to you a little bit about the most popular modules. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to venture a guess about the most popular modules. Um, I have to admit, I was a little surprised. Um, the most popular module is the meditation module. Fifteen participants, 15 of the 32 participants, um, use the meditation module from one to 74 times. And uh, really, most of the comments uh, that we got in exit interviews asking, you know, what, was the, what did you like the most? focused on the meditation module, and I'll, um, I'll show you some, some quotes in a little bit. The second most popular module was actually the storytelling module. Uh, Thirteen of the participants um, had from one to 66 interactions with the storytelling module, and some of them really lasted for quite a long time. You can take that, that module for, for a ride and go for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, at some level, uh, I think this reflects a fair amount of loneliness um, and uh, social isolation for our participants. Um, the third most used module is the symptom module. Uh, 19 people, but um, not nearly as frequently as the storytelling or meditation, uh, which is interesting. But in the symptom module for those 19 people so far, um, there were 61 high-level alerts that were generated. Um, these are severe uh, symptoms and um, uh, concerning symptoms being raised and reported to the system. And, uh, you know, so, um, hmm, I thought I had more on that. But, um, you know, that's data that then goes to the study nurse and the study nurse then messages the teams to, to act on them. So um, here's some quotes about, um, about people's experiences. Um, I enjoyed it when I first turned it on. I was thrown off. She pronounced my name wrong, but that's okay. It's a computer. Got into it and started playing around with it, and it was extremely easy and comforting. It would ask me things and give me the options of how to answer it, which was self-explanatory. Wouldn't be hard for anyone to focus on it and get into it. Or. Um, it's a good thing. I got a lot of help from her, particularly when I was very, very depressed. For example, meditation or talking about my symptoms, and it encourages you to take care, to taking care of yourself, so there's a lot. It's a good reason for motivation for taking care, trying to feel better, helping yourself. Um, I felt like something happened in my life in six months that I had something to look forward to. Started with tablet and the phone calls, and I, and I still like that. She was very good, the way she talked with me, her attitude. She had a very good attitude. She explained different things to me. She can understand what I'm saying because of what I'm going through. She responded very quickly. Here are a bunch of quotes about meditation. Meditation really has so far been the league leader. Um, I liked meditation, did it, did it a lot. It helped me to relax and everything, taking my mind from soreness that I have in the joints. Just sit there and relax, saying how to relax and everything. That was the best. Um, also, you know, the stories um, uh, seem to pop up for people that they like that. Um, this was a quote that I thought was quite interesting, um, and it makes me cringe as a doctor um, because um, it just highlights uh, the, the, dis the discontinuities and the, and the, the, the severe disempowerment and, and distance that, that there can be. This is a participant who said, it was really satisfying because two days after he called me, two days after he called me, and I was very happy because I felt I had someone, some importance to him. So that made me very happy. He called me at 3.15, so from that time until I slept, I was very happy. So what this is is a, a participant who reported pain, 
And then two days afterwards, the doctor called the participant, and this was the this was the response. You know that that uh, that the patient, the participant, was happy because you know that I, that I have some importance to him. That he would call me, and that it, the, the participant was unhappy for the rest of the day. It's it's uh, it's kind of astonishing to me to to see a quote like this because you know I'd like the health system to be responsive. Um, I'd like the person to get called back the same day. Um, and here, the participant was was happy even getting called a couple of days later. And um, it's just very uh, interesting to reflect on, you know, how much room there is for improvement. Uh, we also got some negative statements. Um, this was an interesting one. I don't have any references for where Marie's information bank comes from, and that's the only way I can tell the validity of the information I'm given. Nothing Marie could have done would have made me trust the information more. It's a machine. Absolutely, it is a machine. Uh, you were supposed to do it every day. It was, that was too much. So it was way too much. So um, this person didn't want to do it that frequently. He did it about once a week. Uh, here's another take, um, a different uh, way of thinking about this stuff. Thinking about your illness just makes your illness huge. I work on the theory of avoidance. I hurt all the time. If I start focusing on how the bottom of my feet hurt or how my legs feel like they're going to explode, you know how bad I'll feel in a short amount of time? The more you think about it, it seems just, it, it, like it just increases. So this is a participant who felt that, you know, using the system would remind uh, this participant of, uh, of, of how, how bad her, uh, his or her symptoms were. Okay, so with that, I've, uh, I've powered through with time for some questions or concerns. Um, I didn't really see any come up on the chat. Um, I don't know if people might uh, share their, their comments or questions. Obviously, we're still very much in the midst of this effort. Um, and uh, I think that it's encouraging. There, there are some participants who are using it quite a lot, um, some that really, uh, you know, have not. Um, and it remains to be seen. I uh, have not revealed any of, the, any of the main study outcomes to anybody, um, and nor uh, can I or will I at this point. So I don't know, Bill, if you have uh, questions or thoughts or uh, wonders in my direction? Uh, sure. So, Michael, I'm going to turn this over to Bill Elwood, who will moderate the Q&A. Um, let, me, let me start with a question, though, before I turn it over to him. Um, I, I know this is early data, but you did get this sort of trimodal distribution of satisfaction, some people who really like it, some that don't. It, are there any early indicators of who, like, could you predict who might be more likely to use it and who would be less likely? No, I don't, I don't think I can tell you that. I mean, we've, we've been through several um, projects that uh, in very different domains, and um, it's hard to know. Yeah, I don't think I could tell you. Like, for example, I didn't mention, um, uh, there are eight people who use the spiritual care module so far uh, repeatedly. But the person who used it the most uh, identified as a spiritual humanist and wanted a call from a clergy. So I, I don't think I would have predicted that. And, um, you know, and we were able to facilitate that. Um, and of course, you know, hospital clergy are trained to be ecumenical and, and open to any patient. I just don't think I would have predicted it, um, yeah. you know. Um, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong at all, there's, you know, with uh, identifying as a spiritual humanist and wanting a clergy. It's just, it's just hard to predict, you know. Um, and, uh, um, you know, maybe it makes sense. Maybe that's a person who is... Um, less connected to um, a religious or spiritual social support mechanism of, of their own. Um, so, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll have things to learn, um, you know, and it's going to be hard to know, for example, in that module, uh, if we encourage people to engage with their faith community, um, and then we ask them how did that go, in a subsequent conversation, 
um, you know, we don't have any ground truth. We don't have any data about what actually happened or didn't happen. We can only see if the person's, you know, now satisfied or, you know, how, what they say back to us. So um, maybe I steered towards a slightly different uh, topic, but um, I think ultimately my answer is uh, it's going to be hard to know in advance. Uh, I, do, I do feel that people with less education and more depressive symptoms um, will spend more time in a given conversation on the system, ask more questions of it, um, feel more stigmatized in their interactions with humans, and more support by the fact that they don't have the time pressure here in this kind of, kind of conversation. That's, that's helpful. Good. Let me turn this over to Bill Elwood to moderate Q&A, and he might have questions of his own. I, I do, Michael. We have uh, um, quite a number of questions from uh, um, a group of colleagues that uh, assembled in the room for your presentation. Uh, the first one is a follow-up to, well, I, I guess, what you just said as, as well as the, your, your motorized destructive patient. Uh, um, and, and that is uh, um, the control group. Do they also get tablets and are any of the quote status, any of the exit interview data, are those only from the uh, um, quasi-intervention group or from the quasi-control group as well? The control group participants do not get tablets. Everybody, uh, the control group and the intervention group uh, both get monthly phone calls for quality of life assessments, and uh, we are also tracking uh, health care utilization and, um, and we have a bunch of other assessments in, at, the exit, at the end interview, uh, baseline and, and six months. Um, so there is a, um, a something called a SNAP, for example, a spiritual needs assessment, um, uh, which is done at exit for everybody. So, you know, each of, uh, not each module, there's no data outcome relating to, this, to the storytelling, you know, module. But um, pretty much each module has some data collection associated with it, um, mostly only at the exit interview, although the quality of life, uh, the measure is every month. Okay, super. Do you have any plans uh, um, to consider a broader reach to families and uh, other caregivers uh, um, with Marie or uh, um, any other part of the or, or uh, of this yes. intervention? Yes. Yeah, so I didn't I didn't mention it, but their uh, participants are enrolled with um, an identified um, uh, um, family member or friend um, as a. a, a um, they don't have to be the healthcare proxy, um, but they are, and they're not exactly a research surrogate in potent, you know, uh, to be leaning towards that. But uh, there is a, this other person uh, that gets enrolled with the with the patient. Uh, I didn't talk anything about that. Um, there is a web interface that they can be, that can be shared with them if the participant agrees um, that they can also see. Um, data there, uh, for example, uh, symptom data, um, and it can be, you know, tracked we, uh, on, that, on that side of the interface. You can see graphs, for example, of the symptoms over time. Um, I, I haven't shared anything about that. My sense is that actually not, it's not used as much as I would like. Um, I, as I was hoping, so I, but I don't have like an updated report of, from the families facing web interface. Um, so they they don't they wouldn't they don't right now we don't have a tablet version for them, but we have a way for them to see data about the patient if the patient agrees to share it. Okay, super. Thank you. Uh, um, would. Would you mind reminding us of the um, composition of your research participants? 
Uh, I didn't put all of the uh, um, the demographics up here. Yes, perfect. Uh, uh, um, you, that's, that's going back to that slide for a moment, I think will help this online participant. If I remember correctly, uh, uh, um, well, actually one of the questions we have in the the room is is about uh, um, I think about a third of your sample is financially unstable. Uh, um, yeah. and, uh, the question in the room, uh, um, thank you for bringing back that slide so our online viewer can see that. Uh, and I'll, I'll field the question while you're on it in the room. Does, is, does financially unstable uh, um, in, also include the possibility of, of being, uh, of housing instability as well? Uh, so yes, uh, there, so far to our knowledge, I mean, people don't always uh, um, um, respond to uh, social determinants of health screening questions um, the same way, but we, we know of three participants who are, um, who are in shelters. Um, including the guy in the motorized chair is actually in a, uh, lives in a homeless shelter. Um, so the financially stable um, variable here is actually a combination of either housing insecurity, food insecurity, or utilities insecurity. So in the last year, uh, if, if they didn't have enough food to eat, if they didn't have stable housing, um, or if their utilities were at risk for shutoff, uh, is this group. So. That's actually, um, I, I'm, yeah, that's what that variable means. Okay, super. That's just great. Thank you. Uh, would you mind, uh, well, we have a, a general question. What does the storytelling module do? I, I know you told us that it's based on an online soap opera that, that uh, um, Marie, uh, um, that informs Marie. Is it simply Marie telling those stories? Yes, astonishingly enough, it's just a storytelling opportunity, and um, it is interesting. Uh, a few questions here and there for the participants to answer a few questions that we effectively get some bits of data to use back in Marie's voice along the course. So it's not simply reading the story. Marie will use the participant's name or a few other features that Marie knows, that the system knows about the participant, but mostly it's just a storytelling function. Okay. And um, I should say that, you know, interspersed with these interactions, there is also social chat that does happen I don't think of that as a whole separate module, but there is some social chat that holds these interactions together, and also um, some, uh, there are also places where we seek, uh, where we have empathic turns. Um, that it, that's not like its own module. These are just, um, you know, ways to connect things together. Um, so, um, Kind of in the in between, there's a social chat that can connect. You know, if people are finished with some module. For example, if someone is finished a meditation, um, and we say, you know, would you like to try some, talk about something else? You know, we haven't talked about your pain for a while. You know, I, I was sad to hear that you you had a lot of pain the other day. You know, so it there's a kind of other things that are happening to try to keep the conversations going. Okay, great. You're speaking of Marie. Uh, um, you told us also about Louise and Tanya, and and that you you use you know community-based input to create and refine your characters. Uh, do without giving away your secret sauce, is there anything else you might share about what goes into developing the, the, the character's characteristics? Well, I, I, I wish I had, I wish I, I knew how to bottle the sauce. I, I'd be happy for people to, to share it and, and to do stuff with it. You know, these, um, 
to me, these uh, these this kind of a system is is great fun um, because you know it's just software. It'll, it can say what it can do. It can say whatever you want it to say, um, and um, I, I know from you know audio tapes with with providers that providers really make very very few empathic comments um, and uh, frequently uh, interact in you know ways that you would say that's just too rude um, you know like you can hear on audio tapes the provider will say you know with with doctors will say you know uh, uh, is, you know, how will you, any medical problems in your family? Is your mother alive? How old is she? And you know, the patient will say, "Oh, she she died," and the doctor will just say, "Oh, what she died from? You know, she had breast cancer." Oh, and your father any medical problems? And like, you know, you wouldn't talk that way to a person, but providers do that all the time. So it's um, it's a kind of a strange reflection on the on the on the culture of medicine that patients would. Find this stuff acceptable, <laughs> but 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 they seem to. Okay, uh, um, I, I don't know if that was the answer, but um, you know, uh, I think I think when you talk to patients and you say, you know, um, and you you try to get them into a mode where they are thinking of like who who could this character be and what is this character saying. It can be a little too abstract. Um, so one thing that we do is we, we come to the room with about 20 different images and, and then ask some. Oh, too abstract, people won't understand, especially people with, with low uh, literacy. You know, contemplating counterfactuals can be very, very challenging and not productive uh, type of of uh, you know an interaction, so if you but if you put 20 images in front of people and you say, uh, which one of these do you think could be trustworthy, or you know who do you think could be motivating to you to you know if you wanted to start something new like to exercise more, uh, you know then you can get people starting to open up about it and uh, you, you need to get people talking or else you don't really get it what they're thinking. Okay, that was a great description. Thanks. We've got one more question about the, the, the very popular spiritual component. You, you mentioned the, the broad base of both culture and, and faith involved in creating that curriculum. Are there faith-specific prompts further into the spiritual module, or do, do faith-specific uh, um, messages come only upon referral to a chaplain. Oh, there's a fair amount of specificity in there that it, the things that are specific to faith. Um, um, so, you know, it, it does go into a history if the person wants to share. It, it skips it right away if the person is not interested in sharing um, their personal background. But, you know, if the person's interested, it asks about uh, faith identification and, and growing up in family and, and religious education and different things. And then then that's connected to other types of uh, parts of it. So, for example, if you identify, um, you know, as a Christian, it, it tries to ask you about different holidays that you like to, uh, to participate in. And all of that is connected to uh, a, a, back, a calendar on the back end. So, you know, if it's coming towards Easter and you told us so that you celebrate Easter, you know, so, you know, a couple of days before, in the week before, if you're talking to the character, they'll say, hey, Easter's coming. Um, it, it, you told me that you, you like Easter, or, or like sometimes you celebrate Easter, or whatever, depending on what they told us. So um, there, uh, when we have opportunities to identify concepts or data bits about a person and their practices, uh, we look for ways to bring that back to use that when we can. Um, so that kind of identification of religious activities and holidays and, and prayer practices is has a different version of it for um, a whole bunch of different faith traditions. 
So we actually have had a, a Muslim participant um, who used this module multiple times and, and, and took that whole different path through connected to uh, Muslim holidays and during the course of their participation was uh, adherent to Ramadan and the character is, is able to reflect with the participant about that. Oh, super. Uh, one more late-breaking question. Does the medication module, does, does, with, does Marie remind participants to take their medication, or is it more about suggesting participants how to take medic medicines when they ask, Marie? Okay, so this system is not an adherence program. It, is, it okay. really is not. It's not set up for, uh, with that agenda. Um, we uh, um, we have other we have other activities in that space and proposals in that space. Um, when this system is really oriented towards patient symptoms, so if the patient says that they have a symptom, and the most common symptom reported is pain, then we are going to try to engage with them and ask them about their medication taking related to that symptom um, and and then some problem solving related to that uh, it, that you know the 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 pathway the clinical pathway is just very different if the person rates their pain very high and they're taking all the medicine they've been given that's a that's a different story than if you know if they say I've run out of medicines or uh, I, I don't want to take those medicines. I'm afraid of addiction, or you know. So all these things we're trying to um, to, to capture that, and and basically to encourage people. Um, we've had you know little old ladies basically who are afraid to take their Tylenol because they see all this news about addiction, even though they're you know dying of cancer. And so the system basically is encouraging them to take their Tylenol and to continue to see if it's helping and then, you know, to send messages back to, the, to their provider and say, you know, this person's in pain, um, is afraid to take their medicine or whatever the situation is. Got you. That was a great explanation. Bill? Great. Well, Bill, thank you for moderating the Q&A. And Michael, thank you for that presentation on embodied conversational agents to improve quality of life. Thanks very much. Um, I also want to thank all of you who joined online today. If you have colleagues who are unable to join, remind them that there's a recording of today's uh, webinar that will be available in about a month. Uh, next month, their OBSSR director's webinar will host Dr. Russell uh, Podrak uh, at Stanford University, who will present on data-driven ontologies for mental function. The next webinar will be Monday, August the 20th at 1 p.m. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Michael. Bye.